Well, it's wonderful to be here with you today, Francis. Gosh, I've been a long admirer of your work, your spirit, your endeavors. And today we're going to be talking about moving fast and fixing things. Uh, and the name of your brilliant book, which um, is for trusted leaders, and it's focusing on solving hard problems. So the emphasis on trust and hard problems. The book is so necessary, so refreshingly different from other books that sometimes are a little bit turgid, has a pace to it. You talk about a week, and and here's the radical bit. You actually talk about having the weekend off, which um, for many executives and academics, dare I say it, is, um, is heretical. Um, it's an absolute joy to read. You, you blend serious points with a realness, having been there, seen there, done it in this space in business, and humor. Can you believe it? So I hope we have a little bit of that, but uh, I highly recommend it to everyone listening or watching this and welcome to the show. Well, I'm already going to sh show the introductory clip to my mother. So mission accomplished. Okay, we're done. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. So let's get stuck in and let's practice what we preach in terms of this, this book. Trust, a topic you know brilliantly well, of course. When I think of trust, I think, gosh, that takes a long time to build. Um, at the same time, the whole premise of this book is get on with it, don't break things, get on with it. How do you turn that sort of combination of a long-term endeavor with short-term actions, how do you turn that from being a potential trade-off into what I th maybe think is a paradox? Yeah, so it turns out that if you know the secret memo of how to build and rebuild trust, it doesn't take a long time. So it's been, people have said this, oh, it takes a lifetime to build, a moment to lose, you can never rebuild it. Almost none of what I just said is true. Um, I don't blame the people who have said it. I think it's when they didn't know the underlying architecture of trust, every, they would have to try things again and again and try all kinds of different things. But now that we know that trust actually has three component parts, you only have to work on those three things. You don't have to work on four through infinity, which is what I found people working on before. Um, if you're rebuilding trust, it's guaranteed to be one of those three things. You have to first figure out which of the three it is because the prescriptions are very different. And so that it's not a yes. cliffhanger for our audience. <laughs> the three things are, you are more likely to trust me if you experience my authenticity while also experiencing my logic and while also experiencing my empathy. So when you have the, 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 the map of how it works, it actually doesn't take a long time. Your pyramid, your triangle has been essential for many of the things I've done and my clients have done. It's interesting, having moved into a more virtual world, having been in a very, very face-to-face -face environment, I thought, gosh, it's going to take years and years. But actually with your nudges and your insight, actually in trying to practice what, I, what you say, um, perhaps hasn't been, as hard as, hasn't been as hard as I thought. So thank you for that again. So let's keep going. Let's, you talk about these fixing hard problems and you know, I'm working with clients and they're, you know, they've got to do the usual stuff, make money, uh, and they're facing a context and a set of systems, which is fragile. There's big issues. They don't, not sure whether they should do anything about, speak about whether it's social inequality, geopolitical conflict in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, how do you move fast when you're really tackling major either organizational and or sy systemic issues? So I find that the higher the stakes, the easier it is to move fast. So let me explain <laughs> that if, if I go and work with a company and they're like, oh, we want to fix this. I'm like, I, if we get there, what will we achieve? And whatever they say, I invariably respond, let's add a zero to that. And now we have everybody's attention and now we, now it's worthy. Nobody's going to wonder if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Nobody's going to think, oh, this is a flavor of the month. No, now this is a worthy thing. And now we can, to use your phrase, get on with it. So it's actually more difficult to move fast on less important things because you can't really galvanize people. And how how open should that process of identifying the the big big problems? Because obviously we've got a movement now of more open approaches to, to organizational change strategy, um, and some people think that's uh, you know sort of other words for open. Everything's open. Everything's democratic. How does how does that work? How do you get to that identifying the the, the big one, the big zero? 
Yeah, I'm not sure it should be totally democratic. So I think that these are the de- these are the strategic decisions, and we pay people and <laughs> and require and ask of people to lead. Um, and in part of that, I want them to take input from everyone, but then they have to take the decision. And so I think the for the leaders need to decide confronting our organization, which is the big problem we should work on now. And I don't know that I would hold a vote for that because the leader is going to have peripheral vision. The aperture is going to be much wider than everyone else. So everyone will be doing their best, but with narrower apertures and would be, I think, might not come to the optimal for the broad constraints. Yes, yes. So when you talk about people participating more once those that decision has been made, um, the one thing I love is you, you call out the indignities, uh, the indignities list, which I read and thought, oh, yes, gosh, why haven't I heard it or seen it framed in that way? That's the beauty of Anne, uh, Anne's language. Uh, she, she really has a way with it. But, it. but it is the, you know, when we ask people, are there any indignities <laughs> that you or people like you are suffering? It re- we used to ask paragraph-long questions, and then yes. we kept narrowing it in and narrowing it in, and, <laughs> and that one is better than any other paragraph. It just, people can answer it, they can answer it, Immediately, it doesn't silence them. It actually makes them want to speak. Um, so that's after a lot of trial and error. That's the one that works. If you're in an organization that not only has lots of indignities, but actually there's a deficit of trust, whether it's in a team or organization-wide that perhaps has reputational issues, does that mean that you, know, you just spend more, you have a longer Tuesday to use your, your framing? Um, well, I... I do think it only takes a day in this in the in the in the rhythm of this because if you have a deficit of trust with a constituent, trust is broken, and you want to figure out which of the three uh, pillars of trust is broken and solve that. Now, it could be that for this constituent, it's empathy; for that constituent, it's logic. What we find, though, is that it's more often than not one pillar across multiple constituents. So I will say that's a shorter Tuesday. (laughs) If it's Mm. the one thing, if it's empathy across everyone, that's a shorter Tuesday than if it varied across all of them. We find it to be more often one pillar across multiple stakeholders. That's interesting. And when you, as you have those conversations and you really dig into the, the issue and you start exploring new, new avenues and opportunities, you want to make some new friends um, who may think differently and should think differently from either yourself or some prevailing norms. That's the power of genuine, not only representation, but inclusion and belonging, which I'm a big proponent on, even as a white male. Um, as a white Especially male. Especially as a white male, uh, I'm going to exactly, say. Yeah. Yes. You got you got there before me. Um, how do you bring that together? Uh, and the reason I say that is I've been in lots of great project teams which have had that, but then bringing that into some form of cohesive, okay, let's then make a decision can be quite hard. You do this sort of exploration, uh, everyone feels involved again, but actually drilling down to, the, okay, what are we going to do next can be hard. How do you get the balance right? Yeah. So I think that the reason we want to make new friends is so that we have a representative candidate of people. When we say, what have we missed? There's a chance of somebody telling us or whose voice has not been included. There's a chance of someone telling us. And usually the, whatever teams we're using there, they've been trimmed of some of that beautiful perspective. And so we want to like very deliberately add on that perspective. So I think the, we want to open it up uh, for your exploration. We want to open it up for, can we think of anything else? So we really want to elevate who has a different perspective, who can articulate a different perspective. So seek difference for as long as that takes. Mm. The thing that usually ends up making things taking more time than they should is when we give voice to people saying the same thing. So I'm sure you've been in a meeting and it takes hours and hours and hours, and it's because of the redundancy. It's not because of the unique information that's shared. So we want to be really skilled at deliberately asking for unique information and not indulging too much the repeated 
information. And so when you've gotten what we say is diverge early to converge higher. Yes. And what the mistake that many of us make is we converge accidentally. We converge early and then nobody wants to be the person <laughs> who pulls us off that false convergence. And then we leave the room after a long time and it's not with a very good decision. But if you diverge early, you will then be able to quite exped expeditiously converge higher. As a sidebar, there's a note there for any conference chair who allows um, the awful phrase of let me build on that, which is normally a repeat of what's said. And you go, please move on, move on. Yeah, this is why can someone articulate a different point of view is, <laughs> yes, the, is yes. what we want. Don't just... Don't just say what's been it you've rehearsed beforehand. Say something new and say something different. So you've you've gone through that exercise and everything you said, Francis, is 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 very strategic in the sense you you're making choices about the problem <laughs> you're on you're you're looking to tackle, who's involved and when and how much exploration and so forth. You get to that point, and perhaps you've done that in a team, and perhaps it's successful, and you're beginning to take action. Well, you are. You're going through an exercise, it's not an academic exercise. How would you then scale it? Because that's where I often see organizations stumble. One team has got some momentum, it's got some focus, it's getting on with it, and then they say, copy-paste, or they just say, go and look over there. How do you move from the sort of pilot and prototyping to the, to the scaling? Yeah, so a big thing about scaling is that how do we make progress in our absence? Right? That's the genuine challenge of scaling. So... I have to be able to talk about it in such a way that you consume my talking about it in my absence. And the talking about it is so good and comprehensive and tight that you know what to do. And that's why Thursday is tell a good story. So if you made new friends on Wednesday, we tell a good story, honestly, so that people can make progress in our absence. And if you can't make progress in my absence, I can't scale. I and you and any other single person is not scalable. Well, that's going to be, the limits of that are going to be defined by how well we can communicate. And what we know about communicating is our job is to understand something so deeply that we can describe it simply. And this, too many busy people skip Thursday, and this is why they can't scale. Um, we have to, and, and sometimes I understand something so deeply that I burden you with every number I know and with every nuance I know. And that's fine for a first draft, but I, I kind of want to see your 15th draft. Yes, yes. And, and I want you to keep refining it and refining it. And so what we know is that when I can tell you the story, and the story has to have the past, present, and future. And so the story has to, look, we're telling a story of change. Well, if you're going to believe me and take me as a credible messenger, I have to honor the past. So I have to tell you all the things that are not going to change and the yes. few things that are. So I have to honor, and, and the reason things are not going to change is because they're really good. And the reason that the few things that are is that it's time for them to, maybe it was somebody's fault, but maybe it wasn't somebody's fault. Maybe there was an externality that happened. So I have to honor the past. And then you want that to segue into a really clear and compelling change mandate that answers the question, okay, I believe we need a future, but why now? Why can't I do it next week or next month or next quarter or next year? So you've got to have your, and again, I want this to exist in your absence, usually one graph, one figure, one picture. Why now? And then the third part of the story is, all right, you believe we got to do it, but if I'm to make my idea of the future your reality, I need to provide you both rigor and optimism. So I have to give you a rigorous and an optimistic way forward. And if you neglect either one of those, you shed so many people that want to come along for it. As you go through that, you, I think many people will be listening think, thinking, oh, I do elements of that. But you, you talk in combinations, and deep and simple. Yeah, you know, rigorous and optimistic, and they I mean they do one, but it's so it's. I mean, everyone might tell a good story, but it's often superficial. It's really an anecdote, or it's a little bit sort of icing on the cake. It's and the purpose is frankly to show off or to look clever, not 
effectively to convey, um, you know, why now, why should we change, and convey enough detail simply that people can then take the message and tell others and do it. And you, you get a sense of how difficult we think this is. We, we give a whole day to it. <laughs> you, get, yes. you get as much time to building trust as you do to telling a good story. Like it's, it's that important. Given, given storytelling as a craft has had a lot of prominence over many years, if not decades, why is it still that many, many executives talk a good game and say, absolutely, storytelling, yes, it's really important. And they're just frankly pretty awful at it. What is it? Is it they don't really believe it's important? Is it they don't know how to do it? Is it they don't practice? I think the people that, um, that are true believers have seen the before and after. So once you have been able to communicate a, a compelling story in crisp language after having gone through 10 or 15 drafts, you'll never want to go back to the old way again. But so many people are, and this might surprise you, they are delivering their first or at most second draft. And so you know what? It's not very good. And so from their perspective, communication doesn't matter very much. And it doesn't. It's not good. But you do 10 drafts and then go back and look at your first draft. And then you will never, ever go back. If you had to, if you had to extend that to other leadership failings that you've either researched or seen or experienced, if you only had to pick out one, one more, what would it be and why? You know, I, I guess the other one I would pick out is that um, judgment and curiosity don't coexist well. So most of us find ourselves in a position of judgment quite instinctually. And so the one other thing is I would ask you to purposely invite in curiosity. It will shoo away judgment and you will be... I'm going to say always better off. So mm -hmm. curiosity, choose curiosity, particularly when you find yourself in a position of judgment, because it's the best way to rid ourselves of judgment. And I'm not saying that judgment isn't necessary occasionally, but for the most part, it's actually not very helpful. How do you get into that state of mind when you might be feeling some deep-seated anxiety you might f be restless in a good or bad way but there's a there's some inner inner voices that are telling you get on with it don't don't do it just go for what's expedient how do you how do you get into that frame of mind yeah i think by by you know we we go expediently so we only need a week <laughs> so what i would say is um i if you get on with it you have a high, in that way, in that inner voice way, I fear you're going to break things. It doesn't take much more effort to actually get on with it in a way that is, you, you will marvel at how high and how fast. So move fast and fix things doesn't take a lot longer than move fast and break things. Um, I would just say, don't do it on Monday. Don't move fast on Monday. Wait till Friday. But you don't have to wait till after Friday. But there are those important four steps first. And the power of your work is that you've, if you like, created such a sort of modular, detailed framing of each element that you have to do. Uh, so you may be moving fast, but actually there's a precision uh, to it. And a sequence to it, to your point. Yeah. How do you, how do you, as an ex-consultant, as a recovering consultant, if uh, if I'm allowed to use that term, and my former colleagues will hate me for that phrase, um, you know, you sort of think, gosh, these big meaty problems, you've got to go really deep into the organization. It takes months of collecting data, insight, and so forth. How does that sit with you? Is Is it just they're not doing the right work? Is it redundant again? Look at the actual time spent and compare it to the elapsed time and you will be appalled. I think the actual time spent will be closer to a day and the elapsed time will be months. You're exactly right. But it's like anytime anybody fills out the answers to a survey and then, you know, like our end of year employee satisfaction survey and companies today take three months <laughs> to get back to you. Three months. 
Yes. That's three months of elapsed time. I promise you the amount of time that they're spending is much closer to a day than the three months. So what I would say is I believe them that they're spending months. They shouldn't. The, I just want you to use the actual time, not the elapsed time. Yes. If you are working in an organization listening to this, which is slow, a bit clunky, bureaucratic, and you never really worked at any sort of form of pace, and you, and you may have a leader who's applying the principles and practices of the book, but you're just not used to it. How do you how do you take that leap of faith and frankly use muscles that you perhaps haven't have atrophied? Yeah, I I love that. So one, do it for something that you care about that will get you really excited and that you expect will get other people excited and then call it a pilot. A pilot is a very safe word for people and then let people marvel at the results. So do it in perhaps a walled off garden, call it a pilot. And then when you can do it fast and far and then people knock on the door and say, how did you do it? Share with them broadly. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I want to come back to the uh, topic of inclusion because you talk about that, both you and Anne, in, ver- in the book and on various other platforms as being absolutely critical for winning as an organization, which is something I've written about uh, too, uh, as opposed to just something that's morally important, which it is, an HR issue, which it is, but actually it's fundamental to competitive advantage. What have you seen that's particularly worked in fostering a more inclusive environment? What are the sort of actions you can take? Yeah, well, I do think, and I'm I'm ruthlessly competitive. So I'm I Anne and I joke I'm not off a limb competitive. <laughs> so it's uh, it um, and okay. I I know that if we um, if I get access to the best of everyone and you get ex- access to the best of some. I will thump you. So to me, inclusion on this competitive side, it's just, I want to give people distaste for the small part of the pond that they're fishing in and get them to understand what a competitive disadvantage they're at if they only get access to the best of some. So when I go into an organization and the demographics of the senior team are all the same, And they will tell me, oh, we have a meritocracy. I'm like, you have a meritocracy for that demographic, but I'm going to compete with you on a meritocracy for all demographics. Who do you think is going to win? So I get people, I try to get people a little scared about what they're, the underperformance of their existing techniques and that how much better it could be if we had access to the best of even more people. I love that clarity and ruthlessness. Where did your competitiveness come from? Oh, you know, so I was a college basketball player back when you didn't have to be good to play college basketball. I would like to just clarify on that part. Um, But I I grew up playing, I'm the youngest of six kids, and I grew up playing competitive sports. And what I knew is that competition made me better. Hmm. So when I had sports where I could compete with people, I improved at an accelerating, like just at a beautiful exhilarating rate. If I didn't have people to compete against, my improvement plateaued. So I've been an improvement junkie for a long time. It's no surprise that I'm an operations professor. Um, And competition is the greatest single thing that can help everyone improve. Just the act of competing, you and I will figure out a way, we will both get better if we compete. It's it's actually quite unbelievable to me that that's the case. So that's where it comes from. With with me, it came from sports and my experience of my own improvement journey. I remember as a, as a youngster playing the, playing the trumpet and moving from different groups at different levels and being the best of a smaller group and then moving to the next one. And, wow. And then suddenly having to really up my game to <laughs> stay stay. And isn't that ex- exhilarating to see the before yeah. and after? And I can still remember those moments. Right. You could have stayed in the small group for a lifetime and you would never, ever have achieved what you did with the broader exposure. Yeah. Keeps you humble as well. Genuinely humble. (laughs) You get knocked down and trumpeters are not particularly shy individuals, I can tell you. I didn't Um, know that, um, actually. 
Yeah, no, there. I mean, there's there's a quite a lot of arrogance to. I mean, you you you're you have, what you, you if you're playing in an orchestra, you don't have that much to play, but it's quite you know you, you it's quite exposed. You get it right, it's brilliant. If you get it wrong, everyone hears you. So there's a sort of degree of you know you think you're marvelous one thing the, the conductor often does right at the beginning is put his, his or her hand up to the trumpets just to say be quiet i want to hear the rest of the orchestra there you go there's a random comment i love that can i ask you just one more random follow-up who's Please. what's the most humble instrument if the trumpeters are on the what what's what's the what's the instrument that has all the humility well surprisingly i would say the violin um and, and whether you're the leader or a uh, sort of violinist, the first or second violin, because you are carrying often the, the tune, and there's a lot of you, but you have to be cognizant of all the rest of the flavors of an orchestra. Um, so that'd be my, my immediate one. I think probably my first reaction was going to say, oh, bassoon or something, sort of quite a bass sort of thing. But actually the violin, I think they have a, such a position. Maybe the bass, uh, the bass violin, if that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, a bass, yes, yeah, a big bass. Um, I'm curious, I mean, going back to the, the book and your, your work, I think it's radical. And a radical is a good thing. So do, so do we. We, think it, we. we agree with both statements. We think it's radical and we think radical is a good thing. What are you most proud of in it being radical? That um, the the move fast and break things. Well, everyone is like, oh yeah, that doesn't sound right. Um, I don't want people to move fast and break things. But what I really don't want is the people that cower into responsible stewardship of going slow. And so the thing I am most proud of is any time it instigates movement to the people who have cowered into slowness because of some fear of being reckless. And, you know, I picked up the newspaper today. I saw articles today on people were saying, oh, if it's really important, go slow. Like people I know and love and respect are constantly advising people to go slow. And it's not the right advice. Yes, I agree. So what I'm most proud of is when I can get this very counterintuitive thought in there. And when I say not the right advice, if you care about performance, it's not the right advice. Like we will get yes. there. Um, I will also say that in our work, when we would sample on successful change, we have never met anyone ever who said in retrospect, I wish I had gone slower. So all of the people that are advising to go slow are not the people who have actually been involved in successful change because not a one of them has ever advised to go slower. Your work, your collective work is very precise and in what it says, and yet you've communicated, not yet, and you've communicated in such a, an engaging, colorful way. That is really, really hard to do. Um, you get superficial books that are fun to read. You get, frankly, turgid books that are you sort of necessary to read. But the, the, re, the way it's so accessible and usable, and you read it, having gone through a lot of this change, yeah, and you go, yes. That's how we should be. You know, doing David, it. what I what I think that might be due to is Anne is a beautiful writer, which doesn't mean her first draft is great. She she writes again and again and again. And anything we talk about, I have tested in front of audiences hundreds of times. So yes, we are right. not showing exactly. anyone early drafts. As you've been developing the, the book and your work, what was the biggest trust wobble that you had between you? Oh, well, m mine is an empathy wobble. So I, um, my authenticity and logic are usually just pretty there, but I can get self-distracted and it's usually in the form of impatience. Wow. So when I become, Im and impatience, when we're, whenever we're impatient, it's about us, it's not about others. And I, so just to give you an example, when I watch TV, I do it on an iPad so that I can fast forward. <laughs> so <laughs> this is like, I don't know if it's genetic or not. So that's my watch out. Anne's is very different. Um, Anne is an empathy anchor. So, um, but Anne's is, she has an authenticity wobble. And I think it's because her empathy is so strong that she can tell what you want to hear. And if she's not careful, she'll become it. Gosh, that's so, that's so good. 
I always ask uh, my guests two questions. Uh, one is, what is the impact you're looking to have on the world around you? Well, I, I want to democratize access to everything I know so that um, it resets the competitive playing field. So, for example, that inclusion helps you win. Today, if a company is lucky enough to work with us, they're going to get a competitive advantage when, I, when they get to see how to do that. I want that to go away. I want everyone to know this. So I want everything I know to reset the what's baseline for the playing field so that people can go differentiate on other things. And you do that. I mean, your work, you, you share so much of your teaching and learning so generously and so brilliantly. Where do you get your inspiration from then? As you're setting the bar higher, where, where do you go next? Um, that's a good question. The democratizing education is really what's on my mind. So um, I work a lot, like I've perfected now because we were in COVID, what the video should look like. And I can do lots of stuff technologically. I've tried to optimize the audio to reach people who aren't. So I'm looking at different channels to reach more people. You know, if I have a video and, or if I have a book and I don't know, if a book sells 50,000 copies, people go nuts. Well, I can put a video out and 200,000 people will see it in a few days. So, so I want to, I, you know, I see 9 billion as the audience or whatever the number of people are. So I'm not going from zero. I'm going from there. So I want to perfect all of the different channels and, and try to reach as many people as possible in the debt that in that democratizing education. And for two reasons, one, it's, I mean, one, I want to do it, but two, the message gets so much better and so much tighter, the more varied people that interact yes. with it. And so I want to interact with more and more varied people. That precision again. And when you're having your absolutely best day, you're smashing it out of the park, you're doing your best work, everything's going flowingly. What practices that you, you use help you the most? So Anne and I are married and married with children. Um, and when we're at our best together, we're a 24 seven shop. <laughs> She's a morning person. She wakes up between 3.30 and four in the morning. That's when she starts working. Wow. I stay up quite late. So the best day is when I've handed off something to her. I go to sleep. <laughs> she wakes up, gets it, works on it. We call her it her morning brain. It's the most beautiful, pristine thing in the world. And then when I wake up, there's another draft. So, and this can be with, if we're having an issue with our kids, if we're having an issue with our work, if we're thinking, just daring to dream. But when we get to make progress when we sleep, <laughs> because the other one is working on it that. in that close thing, that's my favorite day. Gosh, that's my wife and I, my son doesn't sleep well. He has a brain injury. And so uh, I'm up at night a lot. And perhaps we should be doing the handoffs better. So that's something I take from that. So thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about the brain injury. And I do think there's something to the handoffs. Yeah, yeah. Francis, that was a, wow, enriching, precise, stimulating conversation. I hope I can democratize uh, your message and your, and your work and your aunt Wan's work with a, a bigger audience. Where can, where can people find you and there's lots of places but which ones would you pick out in particular so i think link if you want to see like the latest thinking linkedin is a is a good place and then we have a website anandfrancis.com but you have to remember there's like a lot of extra letters and, and double n's and e's and things like that so sometimes the spelling can be problematic so linkedin i think is a great place as a as a start fantastic well, thank you for your time today. That was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. That was another edition of Lancefield on the Line. I do hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Please do check out the other episodes in the series. Uh, sign up to the YouTube channel, to the podcast. Give us a nice rating if you're being, feeling particularly generous. And Francis, thank you ever so much again. Thank you so much. It was just a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs>